speaker is Scott Gordon, who used to teach here at the State, now he's at the Second Life State. Uh, he's going to talk about Lax and Mini Lax. Great to be here. You don't know what Mini Lax is this year, but you have to be here. Today I am very pleased to introduce you to the Mini Lax of Stanford, who is one of the world's authorities of the division, and she's going to bring us up. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, students. Just to uh, get to know you a little bit, are you all undergrads? Yes. How many? How many seniors? How many juniors? Any freshmen, sophomores? Oh, you're brave. <laughs> Uh, this is my first time in uh, uh, Sonoma State. It's, you have a beautiful campus, and thank you for uh, coming despite lunch hour. So um, I'll try to be quick, so I can stand in between you and uh, lunch. Um, so like uh, uh, George said, I'm here today to just share with you some of the latest research and, and the journey that the field of computer vision has taken. And uh, for those of you who uh, look at this title and, and wondering this phrase, visual intelligence, what does it mean to be visually intelligent? I think that the way to really uh, <coughs> introduce you to the concept of visual intelligence is to think about our own vision. Humans are incredible visual animals. In fact, that more than half of our brain is involved in visual processing. And we do a phenomenal job in terms of seeing and understand what we see. We're not just cameras taking pictures. We really process the, the entire visual world. So here's an experiment to um, illustrate how good we are as visual animals. And this is an experiment I ran with a PhD student at Caltech. Um, Suppose you are a human subject in our experiment. I'll sit you in front of a computer screen. You start with the gray screen with the uh, black cross. This is where I ask you to look at. And then once I start the experiment, you will see in every trial a picture that flash on the screen and quickly go off. And after it flashes, I'll, I'll put a wallpaper looking pattern that is just to stop any uh, residual um, imagery you have in your retina. And then after you, 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 you see that quickly flash picture, you're supposed to type what you see. Of course, today I'm not going to ask you to type what you see, but I want you to just <coughs> pretend you are a subject and look at the, each of these pictures that's flashed on the screen and think about what have I just seen, okay? Let's uh, <coughs> try this. What do you think? They're quick, right? Um, but despite that, most of you have gotten at least some of the pictures. What, what, what do you think you've seen? Some bikes. By train. Yeah. Choir. Train. Yeah, some choir. Yeah, some choir. People. 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 Kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. Kitchen. Beach. Great. Office. Well, this proves you have a robust visual system. So some of these pictures are presented for about 40 milliseconds. That is 1 25th of a second, talking about a split second. The longest picture that's on the screen for you to see is 500 milliseconds. That's, one, that's half of a second. So this experiment shows that when we ask subjects to see something, a picture like this, and just type what they see. And we're really, we're really quite shocked by how much people can see. You know, people, <coughs> if this picture is presented for 500 milliseconds, human subjects can type stories and sentences. Depending on how much we pay them, we can go on and on. So, you know, they, they see people, they see the, the environment, they see the setting, they see uh, the, the game that they're playing, they see the mood and then the gestures and, 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 and so on. So this is to just put all of us on the same page. These 
this experiment illustrates we have a very powerful human visual system. And part of the quest for computers is one day, you know, my dream is to develop a computer vision algorithm that can write these stories. And we're not there yet, but eventually we hope to get there. So <coughs> it's easy to see how humans can type stories, but um, to operationalize this dream and to think about what are the tasks computer vision algorithms need to solve, let's start listing some of the different aspects of visual intelligence. And uh, I use the following example to, to list these. Um, so this is my son. And in this picture, he's uh, a little over um, a year old, not quite a year and a half yet. And uh, as a young child and a baby, um, <coughs> around one year old, what can his uh, uh, visual uh, system already um, um, already know? What does his visual system already know? So first of all, he sees shapes and colors. He, uh, he might not have the name triangle yet, but he's perfectly okay in knowing this is one type of shape, and the circle is a different type of shape. He can discriminate, differentiate these shapes and colors. So that's one task a visual system needs to solve, shape and color recognition. Another task is that he has, when he's put into this library room, he has a general sense of layout. Layout involves 3D, right? He doesn't think that I'm in this room, what I see is a flat picture. His visual system is already able to figure out this 3D layout. <coughs> His visual system knows the movements. He definitely knows things are moving towards him, away from him to certain directions, and you know, the mouths are moving, and so on, the arms <coughs> are flapping. He actually, uh, by, by one and a half year old, he can name things. <coughs> he might have incomplete vocabulary, clearly, but he can name a lot of objects. He knows mom and dad, humans, certain types of toys, and so on. That's object recognition. He definitely understands actions and interactions. It is very important for small children to already understand actions because they have to develop that social social skill. He knows, you know, someone is hugging, someone is standing up, someone is walking, and so on. Um, he knows how to navigate. You know, this is related to the layout recognition, that you put him in a room like this, if he wants to go from this point to, you know, the student in red shirt, he knows he needs to, to find a way to get there. So that's navigation. And um, <coughs> he also needs, he gets the idea of the affordance of objects, or the functionality of objects. <coughs> By one year old, the most things are eatable, uh, <laughs> including, you know, anything, um, blocks and chairs. But, but the, he also knows something is a surface, you can place a toy on top of it, you can sit on something. Um, and uh, he has social intelligence, visual, visually related social intelligence. Can recognize someone might be friendly and someone that might not be so friendly. So, so this is a list. <coughs> it might be an incomplete list, but at least this is a based list of computer vision goals we need to achieve. And if we <coughs> achieve that goal, I would feel very, very happy about where we have brought uh, computer vision to. Uh, but the truth is, let me just uh, make sure everybody in this room knows that no computer vision system today can do what a one-year-old does. This is a young field. This is an exciting field. A lot of things are happening, but we're nowhere near to complete that list of tasks. Okay. So this is where this is our quest, and. Uh, so, um, in this talk, I'm going to put out two claims coming from the field of computer vision and artificial intelligence. And here's my claim number one. Looking at this list and looking at what computer vision needs to uh, achieve, 
I claim the dream of computer vision is the dream of AI, artificial intelligence. Those of you, you're, you're, you're too young, but when I was a student, um, a senior year in undergrad and as a PhD student, we were actually told computer vision is a module of AI, more or less. You know, it's a perceptual or a visual module, and then you feed it into an AI brain, and the AI brain completes that. The more and more we realize that vision is actually the in part, uh, entire pipeline. It goes from perception to cognition to reason. <laughs> and uh, one evidence for that is a standard definition of artificial intelligence is that it's the study of the computations that make it possible to perceive, reason, and act. And if you look at what computer vision needs to achieve, you know, a lot of these tasks about shape, color, objects, uh, motion involves perception. A lot of these uh, tasks involve <coughs> understanding actions, interactions, affordances, social, um, and, and all this involves reasoning. And a lot of the vision tasks involving, again, action, navigation, affordances involve acting. So, so this is just to um, you know, share with you what over the past 15 <coughs> years my own thinking about computer vision has uh, evolved quite a bit. Today, I, I feel very exciting that how much this this area is is about and how, how much we need to do to, to really achieve this. Um, you're mostly computer science students, so you appreciate technology and, and how it can better our lives. So I, I don't feel I need to really try very hard to convince you. Computer vision technology can impact almost every aspect of our lives, individual lives and society. We think about gaming, think about uh, outer <coughs> ocean or outer space exploration, personal robotic assistance, uh, surgeries, um, you know, movies, um, surveillance, autonomous vehicle driving, um, um, security, and, uh, and 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 other uh, military uses. So, computer vision technology is going to be everywhere and is everywhere. Um, actually, maybe I should just ask you. Everybody knows what this is. Good, connect. Right. Uh, everybody knows what this is? Mars, Mars rover. It doesn't really have a vision algorithm, but almost a tiny bit. Um, everybody knows that, right? Gollum. So the whole, uh, the whole uh, movie, the production of Gollum is uh, computer vision motion capture of putting uh, motion sen uh, capturing uh, um, sensors on, on the on the actor and, and, and using cameras to track his movements and then use computer graphics to, to put the texture of Gollum. Um, everybody knows this? Anybody? Uh, it's the real <coughs> Big Dog. Big Dog. Yeah. Big Dog by Boston Dynamics. This is a DARPA project that's supposed to be putting the battlefield to, 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 to carry things, save soldiers, and so on. So Big Dog has a computer vision algorithm. So, so vision is really everywhere. So where did all this start? Computer vision um, has a good story to tell. In the summer of 1966, an MIT professor who worked in the traditional artificial intelligence field um, <coughs> felt that the mathematical foundations of artificial intelligence has come to a stage that we can now actually deal with the perception problem and probably solve it. In his mind, computer vision should be a summer project. Just one summer, they can use some summer workers effectively in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. So MIT professor had the dream that computer vision can be solved by a couple of uh, you know, very smart MIT undergraduate students, and that's it. You know, more than 40, almost 50 years later, here we are. 
Uh, every major university has multiple computer vision professors and dozens of PhD students <coughs> working on this. Our annual conference has more than 2,000 people. This field is alive and thriving. We're nowhere near um, achieving the MIT professor's summer dream. But uh, so why is computer vision so hard? You know, I just showed you, I started this whole talk telling you, look, your visual system just sees things so effortlessly. I flash some quick pictures and you see the cats, you see the band or the, the, whatever. So why did it take all these PhDs so many decades that we're not there to achieve what human visual system can achieve yet? So let me try to convince you this is a hard problem. The bottom line is that what we see in pictures are pixels. But what we really need to do for an intelligent visual system is to understand the world. And measuring pixels is not the same as understanding the world. For example, here's a famous monster illusion. Some of you might have seen this. I can tell you these two monsters in the image space, pixel space, are identical. Okay? They're, they're, they're copies of each other. But you don't feel that way. You feel that there is a tunnel, a big monster is coming out of the tunnel, chasing after a smaller monster. You even feel the bigger monster has a, a, a very fierce look, whereas the, the smaller monster has a scared look. All this is because your brain as a computing machine with lots of visual intelligence trained over the past 20 years or 18, <coughs> 16 years, have come to understand what the world is and it has interpreted the scene. It didn't take the world verbatim. Here's another striking example of measuring pixel is different from understanding things. And this is a visual illusion made by Dr. <coughs> Edelson, a, a MIT professor. So we have a checkerboard, and we have a, uh, a cylinder, <coughs> and we have an imaginary light source that has some shadow on this checkerboard. And I want to point to checkerboard A and, and, and the, the, the square A and square B. Now, I'm going to tell you, the grayscale value of square A and square B are identical. You're like, what can be? It just cannot be. You know, this looks so much brighter. You know, look at the pixels. It looks brighter than this. Now, look at this again. They are identical. You know, let me go back. I look at this picture a thousand times, probably even more. I still feel they're different. So I, I put these uh, blockers. So your visual intelligence sitting here, your visual system has taken evidence from the pixel space but interpreted the scene according to what this world should be about. These illusions are made to trick you, but it also illustrates that measuring pixels is very different, is a very different process from understanding scenes. Um, in our daily life, we get people play these kind of visual tricks to us. A street artist painted this, and everybody sees this as a, a street that's broken because of flood. But in fact, that's just a trickery of the visual perspective. This is a famous Renaissance painting that uh, by an Italian <coughs> artist. Nowhere in this picture there is a person. Every single part of the picture is a fruit or a vegetable. Yeah, you, can go to, you can go to a supermarket and make this. Um, yet you see a face. You see the gender, you see the age, you see the expression, you see the, the, the features of the face. Because something is happening in your brain that's taking all these local pieces. You're, you're taking pears and apples and fruits and gra you know, grapes, and you made a face out of it. We don't know how our brain did it, but it's a striking and you can see a face here. Um, another famous artist who plays with visual intelligence is Escher. <coughs> this is a famous Escher painting. If you look at this terrace, you know, there's first 
floor, second floor, depending on, well, if you're European, this is second floor, this is third floor. But it uh, makes sense, right? But if you really start thinking about reason about the 3D geometry, this is an impossible shape. The ladder cannot possibly go this way. Yet something is, you know, the, 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 there's one thing that you can rationalize this pixel space, but there's another thing how you interpret the scene. <coughs> Vision is hard um, partially because the world is so varied. <coughs> you know, Da Vinci has uh, studied objects, including <coughs> cats, and drew all kinds of deformations of cats. And his conclusion is, it's really hard because the same cat can have so many different variabilities in its gesture under different lighting. The fact that you and I re recognize the same cat is a remarkable feat of the visual system because it's impossible we have memorized every single gesture of the cat. You just simply don't have that data. Yet human visual system figure it out. Another thing is to point out why vision is hard is the world is intrinsically 3D. I already said that, right? So nobody here in the audience <coughs> sees me as a floating upper body, right? Like you, you, you actually figured out I have legs and I'm walking. Even though it's occluded, you don't see you don't see that part. So so there is some reasoning about occlusion and 3D and, and layering and all this that has been going on in our brain. So, um, but how is this done um, is still a, a question in, in research. So fundamentally, let me use Plato to conclude the analogy of. Um, of what vision system needs to go through to interpret the world. And this is the allegory of the cave. <coughs> so Plato was thinking about how to describe vision. And he, he described it this way. Suppose you have two <coughs> prisoners, and they're in a cave, and you have tied them up uh, on a chair, um, and they are only forced to look straight at a wall. And in the back, there's a whole world <coughs> of play. And people have different kind of objects and so on. And then you're casting shadows, uh, uh, 2D shadows of the 3D world onto the wall. And the prisoner's job is to figure out what's going on in the back of their head, which they're not allowed to turn by looking at this. This is the same thing that our visual system has done. We're looking at a the projection on our retina is a 2D world, but we have to figure out what the 3D world is that caused this projection. The same thing that a computer vision algorithm needs to do. A computer vision algorithm is giving a picture, giving a video, and, uh, and that's what it is. And it has to figure out what's going on. It took nature billions of years to do this. <laughs> Our brain, like I said at the very beginning of this talk, has more than 20 areas devoted for visual processing. And more than 50% of the wiring and, and, and all this is about visual functionality. So, so I hope that um, um, I have given you some motivation about you know, vision is something humans have achieved despite all the difficulties. And this is an exciting problem for computer uh, scientists, for, 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 for computers to be able to see and understand what it sees. Um, is there any question at this point? All right, well, feel free to stop me any time. Um, all right, so the rest of the talk, I want to take you quickly <coughs> on a journey. And this journey um, will try to cover you um, of some of the key researches uh, that has been going on in the computer vision field, of course biased towards what I have done in the, in the recent years. And uh, um, so we have this list of computer vision or vision tasks that we want to empower computers to achieve. Um, let's just fast forward to 
well, I guess it should be 2014 by now, sorry about this. Let's fast forward to 2014 <coughs> and just look at this list and see where we have come from. Okay? And then we'll go back to the journey and, and walk into a little bit of history. So I would say that we have come a long way in understanding shape and general layout. Without telling you all the details, you as a user, you're already using the fruits of those research. Google Street View is a, is a very good example of using computer vision technology, computer 3D <coughs> technology. Anybody knows Microsoft Photosynth? Right. So Microsoft Photosynth takes user pictures from landmark uh, places of the world, especially tourist sites like the Colosseum or, or somewhere, and then reconstruct a 3D scene of that uh, of those locations. This is using the knowledge we have gained uh, in computer vision <coughs> to do that. So, so we have gone a long way in <coughs> shapes and general layouts. We have come a long way in movements and motion, understanding motion. This is Stanford's autonomous vehicle, Junior. Junior should make a left turn, and he's uh, come to an intersection and stopped because he sees there are other vehicles going back and forth, and uh, he needs to make the intelligent decision to when to make the left turn. And this is all about understanding the movements and motion of the, the environment. Now Junior has successfully made the left turn. Another example we already talked about, Kinect. Kinect, uh, Microsoft Xbox has this technology. In fact, uh, when I was an intern uh, at Microsoft in 2004, they were secretly developing Kinect. So, so I actually got to know a little bit of that secret Xbox project that no one was talking about there, which is Kinect. Um, we have come a long way in face recognition. 2006 was the first camera that had a face detector. Today, all of your digital cameras have a face detector. I'm not claiming it works perfectly, but the field has come a long way in, in, in detecting faces. Uh, um, Google and Facebook in the past five years have uh, both acquired face recognition startups with multi-million dollar prices. <coughs> so this is a, a technology that's uh, aggressively being used in industry. Um, talking about object recognition, another another area of object recognition <coughs> is actually landmark recognition. Google Goggle is a um, product uh, that can recognize very specific objects, such as <coughs> a Golden Gate Bridge, or Eiffel Tower, or a book cover. So if I were to shade that, um, from white to dark on this list of to be done for computer vision algorithm. Um, dark being um, more people have worked on it, we have some solution. I would put the shapes somewhat like this. You know, like some things like uh, um, shape and color and general layout and movements. Uh, we have, I'm not saying it's soft, but we have a good grasp of these problems. But then we have some really uh, lingering open problems like object recognition, uh, action, uh, affordance, and social understanding. All this are open problems in computer vision. And no, not enough research has been done yet. So to illustrate one open problem, uh, does anybody know what this is? It's cute, yep, like three. Anybody from Australia? Is it a wombat? Yes, very good. It's a wombat. Um, if you ask Google what this is, this is what Google thinks it is. It thinks it's a blob against the red background. And the blob can be anything. A face, a soccer ball, a doll, or whatever. So this is a state of the art. Uh, image analysis engine that ink out there in the world today. And it doesn't recognize a wombat. Okay, now you're saying, okay, well, only one person in this audience recognizes a wombat. It must be a hard object. Let's try something simpler. Well, everybody knows what this is. 
Okay, so so your algorithm should learn what a wombat is, be able to recognize a, a new different wombat or, or a new wombat, know where it is, and, and handle all these variabilities. That's what a successful computer vision algorithm would do. Uh, in, in addition, it should recognize wombat 360 degrees. It's actually more than that, it's a million sphere. It should be able to handle all the 3D perspective. And uh, so where did all this start? It started in the 60s. As soon as the MIT professor wanted to do computer vision, he wanted to do object recognition. And what are those days like? Those are way before you were born. Um, there was no data around that time. There was very little knowledge of statistical learning and machine learning. And internet didn't exist. Computers barely existed. And like I said, many of you, that was before when you were born. So how did people even try to solve this problem? Well, they start to think and talk to psychologists. Psychologists like Biederman has proposed that any objects can be decomposed into simple shapes and forms. And these are called geons. So computer vision scientists or pioneers, I would call them, like Rodney Brooks and Tom Finkberg, took this idea and started to compose objects out of these generic simple shapes. <coughs> or, uh, so what they believe is that any object is a configuration of simple shapes. And uh, the way they tested this is, uh, this is one big, uh, good example of face recognition. They think face is composed of these simple blobs um, and, and connected by some kind of spring weight. And here is my favorite uh, experiment. Uh, this is a computer experiment in 1970. You don't even know. You have to squint your eye to recognize this is a face image, this is a corrupted face image, and this is the result of a face recognition algorithm telling you <coughs> the left, uh, the left, I was located at column, no, row 14 and column 12. This is the kind of algorithm people were tell, uh, dealing with. But they actually have gone this far. I, I was impressed in the 70s they can do this. So the dawn of, of the, this is kind of the, the dawn of object recognition, the 70s and early 80s. People had no data, no statistical learning tool. They had a little bit of knowledge from psychologists. In fact, the knowledge was incomplete, so it was kind of a short leg. But these are the pioneers that started the field. All right, so now, where do we go? After 1970s, people tried and feel this problem is too hard. Object recognition is just too hard. You know, we had a little bit of these toy success of these you know, generalized cylinders, but it doesn't apply to anything real. So the field actually uh, took a detour, which is something I'm not going to talk about today. The field of computer vision stopped more or less working on object recognition and stopped working on 3D reconstruction. And this is the, the, a, a different area, or related, but different area of research that got us those Google Street View projects and all this. So that's 20 years of not too much activity in object recognition. But then the special year 2000 came. And when I say year, you know, it's around that time. Something really important happened in 2000. Um, guess what happened? You've never been able to guess. Love happened. You're like, what? So this is the time computer vision found the love of his or its life, machine learning, statistical learning. For those of you probably the professors who have a little bit more knowledge of the field, this is 2000, around that time, that, that 10 years, 1990 to 2000, a big progress in machine learning has happened. Support vector machine, data boost, graphical models, MCMC chip sampling, part of random field, neural network, um, all these mathematically important tools in 
in today's every aspect aspect of today's world, the foundations were, were laid during that time. And computer vision took big advantage of that. So for example, I said 2006 was the first camera uh, from Fujifilm that had a face detector. That face detector was based on this 2001 paper by Paul Mueller and Michael Jones uh, from Merle. This is the first paper that they titled Real-Time Face Detection. And all the cameras, digital cameras we have today, uses a use a face detector based on this app, basically. I mean, there are tweaks and improvements. And this is based on an AWS um, algorithm that machine learning community has proposed. So that's how important this, this marriage is. So um, I'm trying to speed up. So, so it's also personally an important year for me. That's the year I entered grad school. And, uh, and when I entered grad school, my, my advisor and I faced a, a question. Uh, that was before Google. Google was formed as a company, but no one knew Google existed. That was before the explosion of internet. Um, researchers are trying to make progress in object recognition, but it was very difficult to get data. And so we decided to tackle a problem that we call one-shot learning. Can we do object recognition with very little data? So this was a project that I, I, I'm probably going to just really quickly talk to. Um, you're saying, what's one-shot learning? Why do you believe this is even a valid problem? Let me demonstrate this to you. Meet Potapot. I hope you've never met Potapot before. Potapot is lost and he's looking for his family members in, this, in, in, in the following picture. And let's see if by, by seeing one example of the Potapot family, you're able to tell other family members. Just, just find one. That's not hard, right? You say, okay, I think this guy looks like a Potapot family member. What you have just done is one shot learning. You take one example, you formulated an object model in your head, and you apply that to a novel stimuli. Okay, so humans are capable of doing that, and around that time we start to ask can computers do that. Without getting into any details, my the take-home message is through a machine learning algorithm that starts to to take data and, and other statistical information from the world, we were able to do. Uh, a one-shot learning algorithm. And we tested this on face recognition, on x-axis is the number of training examples, on y-axis is the error of the algorithm. You want the error to be as low as possible, zero is best. If it's 50%, uh, if it's 0.5, it means it's random, so the algorithm didn't really understand what's a face. I just want to illustrate to you that our algorithm using the machine learning, um, you know, foundation of core is able to recognize faces even when traditional algorithms failed miserably. Okay. So um, let me just fast forward. So the take home message here is that um, machine learning, this is one example of machine learning making a huge difference in computer, in computer vision and out, uh, object recognition. So our school now have a second leg. And uh, all right, so that was 2000. And I used one example of my own work to illustrate statistical learning really rebooted computer vision, especially object recognition. So around that time, that computer vision was busy falling in love with machine learning. Something else happened in the world. And that's a big deal. This is the time, around that time, in late 90s, starting 2000, some of you are born. Or, or, are toddlers and, and kids in daycare, and uh, the world is <coughs> What is it? The information age has exploded. The internet has exploded. If you look at data from all angles, so um, this is the number of world internet hosts, and look, starting 2000, 
this curve just grow exponentially. You can also uh, measure it by the traffic of the internet. Again, it's a very sharp upward curve. Uh, if you measure by the data, the amount of data that's being trafficked on the internet, again, this is a huge curve. So, so really, um, this is very exciting time for computer science and for information age. By the time we reach 2012, I think this Intel picture, um, for every minute on the internet, we have tremendous amount of data that's being uploaded, downloaded, and shared. And I want you to notice one thing. This is an example of one minute. Notice the bulk of the data. What form are they in? YouTube, Flickr, um, Twitter, Facebook. These data are in the form of multiple. In fact, by 2016, only two years from now, 86% of the entire internet data form is multimedia and, and images. Videos, I count videos as images. This number, in 2012, there were 30 hours of YouTube videos uploaded per minute onto the YouTube server. Do you know this number in 2014? A hundred. A hundred hours of YouTube videos are uploaded as we speak. So this talk, 45 minutes, will have, yeah, go figure. So the data has changed our world. And it should be changing our research as well. And computer vision recognized that. Our field, starting in 20, early 2000s, we start to recognize we need data sets. Without data sets, we cannot do the right research. So we have data sets of, let's say, 20 object classes. This is a famous data set in computer vision. It has hosted international competitions for, for many years. And it came from European Union governments. And uh, it really has propelled computer vision research. It's called Pascal. But Pascal had 20 object categories. The world was growing. And there were way more than 20 object classes, right? Like, if you count the number of objects in dictionaries, it's in the tens of thousands. If you count, you know, like eBay told me that their catalog is more than 60,000. So, so no matter how you count it, we have more than 20 objects in the world. So this is around the time that I started my professorship at Princeton. And I started to ask the question, how do we go from 20 classes to millions? You know, this is the real world question we need to. We, we need to recognize tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of objects and millions and trillions of images, not 20 classes. So this is uh, the project that we call the ImageNet project. ImageNet project was a large scale effort to collect an enormous computer vision image benchmark. Uh, data set. And by 20, uh, 2009, my student and, and I have collected almost 15 million images, over 22,000 classes. And if you log into this website, these, these, uh, all of these uh, data are free to uh, edu educational uh, and research purposes. And um, um, <coughs> I'm going to fast forward this. So, this is just an example to show you that before ImageNet, the computer vision field has put in effort in doing large scale research. Um, the biggest data set was about 130,000 images, but ImageNet really changed the scale and the, the, the game of object recognition and image recognition. New York Times has covered our story. And uh, we have uh, made um, we have made a lot of uh, uh, you know influenced a lot of people in in, in terms of uh, how they can use this data. How many of you have heard the word deep learning? One, two, three. So deep learning as a 
revived uh, new field. It, it, it was an old field in your network, rooted in your network, but it has revived um, by a group of uh, uh, brilliant researchers led by people like Jeff Hinton. And uh, they have um, really changed the way um, how the industry uh, process images. And Google actually, in fact, has bought the company multi-million dollars by uh, Jeff Hinton and his student. And that, that whole um, movement started um, from this paper uh, in machine learning community, MIPS uh, um, uh, learning image that images. So, so we we are very happy that uh, image that uh, became a a, a a player in this big data era. So, um, so let me just wrap up. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, really um, just. So, so image that was rolled out in 2014. So the rest of my, so we sort of have completed this tool, right? Like we have knowledge starting early days, and then we have statistical learning, and we have big data. So um, without getting into any details, a natural question is, where are we going on this journey? Right, we, we, we need to do more. We have big data now, we have. Um, and uh, I don't think I'm gonna get into this but uh, I want you to just take home one message, is that when humans recognize objects, <coughs> back to our one-shot learning, we don't necessarily <coughs> piling all the pictures of, let's say you're a bird watcher, a whole species of bird. We actually have knowledge about the bird taxonomy, the animal world, the, the, the habits of the, uh, the birds, the, the, the trees they like, the flowers they like, the, the, the migration patterns. So what I'm saying is that um, it's time to reincorporate knowledge in a much bigger and statistical way into computer vision. This is no longer just from the psychology labs. This is knowledge about the world. And that would help to really um, make today's computer vision algorithm even better. So let me just um, um, skip all this because uh, I, I think I'm really running out of time. But uh, um, let me just conclude that we have recently viewed a new computer vision algorithm that incorporates the knowledge of the object world. And uh, if we compare our accuracy at any level of performance uh, compared to how much information our algorithm can give, it, it outperforms, outperforms all the previous algorithm. We have built a demo engine called EVA. If you give EVA a picture, it gives you its confidence level about the object. So now back to our famous example of this red background, <coughs> the mobile on the red background. This is what Google gives you. Um, this is what Eva gives you. With 90% uh, confidence, it thinks it's a mammal. Um, it still doesn't recognize it's a wombat because it's a hard, uh, it's a hard object. But uh, Eva has much better recognition than Google. And uh, this is coffee cup or, or mug. Again, Google doesn't know anything. And uh, Eva tells you. <laughs> yeah. I know it's very arcane language, but with 95 confidence, it's a copy. <laughs> so, um, so really, I think the, I'm. This is the the overall picture of the journey we have taken on object recognition, and I want you to remember the importance of incorporating data statistical learning and knowledge. And, uh, and let me just uh, end here with a picture of my lab. These are the graduate students that worked on, uh, worked with. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to